Ashley, Kate, it is so wonderful to have you on the podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Patrick. It's a joy to be joining you today. Well, I want to get started out as as we all do. You know, we come from different family lives. We come from different uh, home lives. And yours really was like everyone was in the performing arts. So did you feel like pressure to do it? Was it like a rite of passage to start? <laughs> You know, that's an awesome question because I, I really believe we are, um, you know, we come from where we come from and we are, you know, a representation kind of of that family life, if you will, especially when it comes to the entertainment industry. Yes, I was born and raised in a loving musical theater family. So my parents were never, uh, you know, stern stage parents, if you will. But they were, you know, loving, supportive, and honest, you know, leaders in the industry, if you will. Uh, my mother still proudly works at the Professional Dinner Theater in the Southern Indiana, Kentucky area um, in, at her age, which is a beautiful and ripe age, uh, heading into her early 60s soon. But she's been there since her early 20s. And it's unbelievable, the consistency of her career and, you um, and my father, the, the late and great Ernie Adams, was just the most loving, generous man and a pillar in the musical theater community where I was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, he unfortunately passed away four years ago due to cancer, but his legacy is living on through me and my sister, who's also in the industry, 10 years younger than me, who's a phenomenal singer. And she just got off the, uh, due to the pandemic, the national tour of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So exactly what you're saying, full family, <laughs> the family business, you know, some people make, you know, uh, air conditioning and heating and cooling. And our family business is, is entertainment in the theater. So very wonderful upbringing and um, very honest portrayal of what I was getting myself into. <laughs> now, has there been that sibling rivalry between you and your sister about doing this show or getting that role? Never. Um, my little sister is like the light and the pride of my life. She's 10 years younger than me. So there's plenty of space for both of us in the industry. And in fact, um, I'm actually her manager right now for her oh, okay. soul country duo, Jamin Ray. And um, we're actually in the middle of helping to produce and distribute their country album. So, so although it really she is, is a, a family business. <laughs> oh, it is a family business, honey. <laughs> we, we are the full family, you know, Swiss Robinson, Adam's family going for it. Yes. Right. <laughs> now, with regards to your parents being so um, integrated into the business, what, what advice did they give you as you were starting out? You know, they always wanted me to do this because they knew it was my identity, who I was. Honestly, you know, how I um, translated love. You know, I grew up watching them perform with the symphonies and singing for the UK and U of L basketball games on the Jumbotron. And they knew that this was what my life was meant to be, but they were also very honest. You know, they graduated both musical theater majors um, in the mid eighties from Eastern Kentucky University, had the opportunity and the gumption to move directly to New York City. And they came here often, but the city was not necessarily the, you know, the safest place to raise a family. And my father always said to me, he's like, and it's going to get me emotional. He was like, I knew that my children were going to do it for real. And that's what he would always say to me as he was encouraging me, you know, as I had these huge ambitions to go to CCM and to be on Broadway, you know, but they were very honest with how much um, drive, ambition, um, sacrifice and that it's it's not always the easy choice, but if it's the right choice for you, you got you got to do it. So I appreciated their transparency in that. And and I imagine with his passing, it almost felt like a passing of the torch to you to carry on <laughs> the 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 legacy and the things that he had instilled in you. Oh, and that's exactly what it's been. You know, um, the past four years to internalize and process such a massive unexpected loss like that 
it can't help but to affect and kind of reframe your work, especially, you know, creativity was mine and my dad's like love language. You know, he would call me every day at noon, check in on all the projects that I was producing, all the auditions. And what I love about BYOP, Be Your Own Producer, which is kind of one of the things we're here to talk about today is I truly feel it is an extension of his legacy, of his creativity, of his love and of his care. And every time I do it, like I work with an artist and help them navigate where they're at either in their personal kind of or professional life or how it affects each other in their, say, their existing project, property, production company, um, navigating all those things. I just, I, I feel him with me mm. and um, he's working through me. And um, the book that I wrote over this past year, BYOP, I definitely felt like he was right there with me, writing every word. Now, was there any advice that that as you were starting out your own journey, uh, coming to New York and everything, was there any advice that maybe didn't come to fruition? It was like, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. Definitely. I mean, they were very impressed with kind of how quickly I made my own individual roots here. And I think they were also very moved by the community that I was quickly uh, surrounded by if you will, because one of the reasons they decided to create a life of the performing arts in the Midwest, in the Louisville, Indiana, Ohio area is because that sense of community from their college and everything was already so strong. But what was so interesting about my transition to, you know, the Broadway community, New York community is I also had that kind of royal bloodline of musical theater as well, because I got to come from CCM. So yeah. a lot of those relationships, right, that I created in my childhood, early adolescence in the Midwest, it ties beautifully here. So they were just proud of me for kind of independently taking on the industry I and mean, not being afraid at an early age to kind of do things on my own terms, if that makes sense. Definitely, definitely. And you mentioned CCM, and certainly over the last several years, you know, 10 or 15 years or so, I would say that schooling has, I don't know, uh, to see a certain school on the resume may mean more than another school. And so that sure. has that has created networking and, and contacts, as you say, but also it impresses some some casting directors more than others. Do you think that the name of the school is very important now, just as being an influencer and all that followship is starting to come into play. Do you think that schooling also bears into it? I do think the schooling bears into it because it shows an entry level uh, of professionalism as the person in their young 20s steps into the industry. I truly believe any collegiate experience is what you make of it. And I never would want to discourage anyone, right? It's like if they have the opportunity and are being sought after by a smaller program, right? It is what you make of it. And as long as you have that one or two teachers that guide you along the way, you're good to go. Right. But if you do get to come from a program in addition to that, like a CCM or Carnegie Mellon, University of Michigan, um, I think casting directors, directors, and other people in the industry know just what a rigorous, you know, time you navigated and therefore kind of what your chops are, yeah. you know, as you kind of launch into the industry. So I don't think it's the make or break um, at all, but I, I do think it is important. And if you have the opportunity to say to audition for one of those schools, why not? Why not give it a shot, you know? And so after you graduated and came to New York, what was what was success going to look like to you? What what was your your goal coming to New York? <laughs> I mean, once again, I went to this direct bloodline to Broadway school. So I thought success meant Broadway show hopping. Now, <laughs> I learned very quickly in fact, within 24 hours of making my Broadway debut in the Tony Award-winning revival of La Cage au Full, that that is not necessarily what success is, nor 
is that a functional way to live as an artist in New York City? It just, it hardly exists. There is the 1% of the 1% who get to live that way, but that in no way bears meaning to your talent or creativity level. It's just what that person's journey is supposed to be. And yeah, so a crazy thing happened. I joined the company as an immediate replacement, <laughs> learned the show for two weeks on my own with the dance captain and resident director. On a Tuesday night, I joined the company, which was led at the time by Harvey Firestein, who wrote the show, so special, playing oh, yeah. Alban. And then Christopher Sieber um, had stepped in as Georges. And literally, I opened the show on a Tuesday night, joined the company, and then Wednesday after the next matinee, they told us the show would be closed. <laughs> My parents had just gotten off the airplane and literally were like, we are so excited to see you under your Broadway marquee. And literally, I bolt out the stage door, and my mom sees me just like, we're here. And I'm like, we're closing. And she was just like, you could hear her. She was like, what? With her big, you know, soprano voice, like echoing, you know, in Times Square. Oh. I mean, it was just like, what? So in that moment, right? you can't help but be affected, you know, similar to my father's quick and, and impactful passing, right? When you have kind of such a, a high life moment and an immediate um, bottom, right? Rock bottom so closely together, you can't help but be affected. And so in that moment, I knew what I thought success was and what I thought where I was going and how I was going about it. I immediately was veering into my own fork in the road to being my own producer. Yeah. Yeah. So that would you say that that was the moment when you thought, okay, I can't rely on other people anymore. Yeah. And I can't rely on only acting. I did not know what I was meant to be doing in addition to acting. I knew I cared about bringing people together. I loved, you know, networking in a genuine way. I loved kind of uh, being a helper, solving problems, being a problem solver, using both sides of my brain. I didn't know at that time that's what a producer does. I had no idea. I mean, I feel like still in the industry, people don't really know what a producer does and everybody's idea of it is completely different. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, but, um, but definitely a creative producer is, is a massive part of my identity and it's been here loud and proud for the past decade now. And certainly part of that identity, even though it didn't last long, is is that Broadway credit. You know, you are a Broadway oh, performer yeah. now. So that that is a moniker before your name. And That's so right. and so did you feel like coming from CCM that that was kind of what was expected that, OK, well, maybe that one didn't last long, but I, I achieved that. I have now oh. made that. Did it feel like you, you'd made it and was now OK, on to the next yes. Broadway show? I definitely felt like I had kind of hit that um, kind of that bucket list moment. And, you know, the career has continued. Like um, not long after I left the Lacage tour and then I covered Maria at Paper Mill Playhouse and The Sound of Music. And then later that season, I was Miss Dorothy in what they called like the smaller revival of Thoroughly Modern Millie at Paper Mill Playhouse that traveled a bit to like the Mulch Jupiter. And, you know, did have done my television gigs and was a lead down at the Re Lynn Redgrave Theater, you know. So acting is still a large part of my identity, but it's just not the only one that I wake up and eat, sleep, breathe all day, every day, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so how has your definition of making it or success changed over the years? For me, what it means to be successful is to live a life where you're able to financially support yourself in any way, honestly, where you're able to create freely in, in with content that you love to make. Because as I've seen with even some of my friends, you know, there are some people who get the opportunity, say, to be in a sit down show for years. Huge honor huge honor to be in some of those machine commercial Broadway shows. I mean, what an honor to get to be in say a Phantom or a Wicked, right? Or a Lion King. And then, you know, many of those people that you do speak to privately, they 
They want to make things. They want to create things. And I am a person who has deeply fallen in love with the creative process. And for me, that is what success means, to be able to do what I love to do nonstop all the time without being completely controlled by other people's needs and knows and, and wants of me and my creativity. That's definitely what success means to me. Would you say that your parents set an example of that type of, uh, that definition of success? Totally. Um, you know, my parents did a beautiful job of so many things, of showing that you can successfully make a living in the business, make sacrifices. Um, my mother did a great job of showing you can be a woman in an industry, right, as a creative, and also be a great present mom at the same time. Um, and, you know, they also just showed me the wealth of life when you allow yourself to be involved in like more than one thing and in more than one community, because we were very active at the professional, you know, dinner theater, Derby Dinner Playhouse that my mom still works at to this day. But we were also big members of the dance studio, of that touring musical theater troupe, of um, the church, the church choir, um, of uh, my mom and dad were in a local quartet for years. So it's like, they taught me how to freelance right before my very eyes. But then there was also a time when there was two other children after me. So there's three kids where my mom stayed working predominantly only in the arts. And then my father would do professional shows at night coming from a nine to five job. So, you know, they just showed me that every combination was possible if you were willing to like put yourself out there and do the work. Yeah. And as artists, we have to have that kind of uh, grab at anything, you know, uh, arms reaching out in all directions to find yeah. work, to find just, you know, sustaining ourselves financially. So it really is, um, you know, acting is hard enough and we're not casting everything that we audition for. So that, no. so there have to be other plans. There have to be other uh, plan B, plan C, plan D. But what that it doesn't mean that you're a failure by any means. I was, I was speaking with a client this week and they're just like, you know, I, the lifestyle isn't quite working out for me. And I think I might want to be open to more of a nine to five thing. And I'm like, if you can make a remote full nine to five salary, even within an arts or education, you know, type administration that makes you happy, which allows you to do your own work and have your own, produce your own cabarets, right? It's like, there's nothing wrong with that. And for me, I've made this life and now multiple businesses by being a freelancer, you know? And, I, and I'm proud to say it. I have a record label. I have a pretty successful production company, you know? I have a book that's coming out, but I still proudly keep my babysitting job. And you know why? Because it keeps me grounded. I love children. It's something that makes me happy. And to be able to enter, you know, that family unit in New York, that gives me peace every week. I know that might sound crazy, but for me to know that there's a few days a week that I will always be going to that house and spending time with that child, it's something that brings me joy. But also from a sustainable standpoint, that type of under the table job it's been an incredible thing to lean on when necessary. I'm in a fortunate position. I don't need that you know, job for the money purposes right now, but I try to encourage all my clients, if you can do something on the side gig related that helps you sustain your creativity and give you cash flow for other things to use it in other places to support your career, like why wouldn't you wanna do it? I don't know, that's just me. <laughs> no, no, because having, having a financial foundation only helps us creatively because then we're not thinking about oh my gosh yeah. and am, am I going to be able to to get groceries and rent rents coming up so instead of having to focus and think about all those financial matters if you have a job or side job that can take care of that then that allows us it frees us up to think creatively to go to auditions or self tape as it is right now you're you're exactly right because all of that weight right and that worry that takes space 
inside of you as the artist. And it's like, if you know that you're going to be okay, then you can wake up and actually focus on what you're going to do to further yourself in your career or what you're going to make today. Now you were able to to branch not only you know you have you have your Broadway show on on the resume, but you were also able to go into TV and on a very popular show, Kimmy Schmidt. Now did that was that like another notch on the belt? That that was another way of saying okay, I'm making it, I'm doing it. Well, the coolest thing about Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt was, you know, I have always looked up to Tina Fey and Amy Poehler because of their presence, their their liveliness, but also their dexterity in the industry, being producers, writers, content creators, as well as, you know, being phenomenal comedic and at times dramatic actresses. So I just, on a personal level, I very much looked up to them and I had just created one of the cornerstone pieces of my production company. And it was called Rules of Cool. It was one of the first New York City-based um, web series other than a little show at the time called High Maintenance. We were the second one. And that show had been such an independent success. And right around that time is when I got cast in Kimmy Schmidt. And I write about this in the book. I'm like, I wonder if like Tina Fey like Googled me, even though it was a small role, like I only worked a full week. But I was like, I wonder if like she, you know, she had to say yes from a tape or whatever pass off on me. And I'm like, I wonder if she Googled me and like was like, it was almost just like high five. You're doing what you need to be doing. And the craziest thing is when I was at Broadway stages where we shot in Greenpoint, I was in my dressing room in between scenes. And that day we sold Rules of Cool to full screen. So I sold my first TV show that I was executive producer of and in while I was in my dressing room acting on Kimmy Schmidt. Like it was all, but I needed that. It was for me to know you're, you're on the right path. Mm -hmm. You might be doing things completely different than everybody you went to school with, but that's okay. You're still getting to the same places in, in a more authentic way, you know? So that Kimmy Schmidt, meant so much to me on multiple levels. I loved, I loved that show. Now, certainly all of us artists, we have those anchor moments that like, like you had, you're, you're selling a show that you were a part of, you're in a, another great show that that's very popular. We, we have those kind of moments, those pivotal moments where we're like, okay, I am on the right path. I'm doing what I need to do. But a lot of our lives, a lot of our careers, we're not having those moments. There, there's there's uh, big gaps in between. So for you, what big keeps you? Gaps. Yeah. So for you, what keeps you going in between those times? Ooh, a phenomenal question. For me to be able to happily sustain a life in the arts, I had to create my own production company because in the times where I'm not being invited or asked to participate, I wanted to make sure that I had work lined up. That is what helps me. That's like the strategic answer for the industry. But from a personal place, and I just wanna encourage anybody listening, it's just so important, back to what my parents taught me, to just live a well-rounded life. And that's different for every person, but I just be present in your relationships, whether it's with your best friends or a significant other, you know, um, if having an animal is something that would anchor you or bring you joy, do that, you know, take classes, stay engaged, stay within the community, stay creative, support other people's art, you know, all of those things really help keep me grounded and completely fulfilled and happy to where it's like the phone might ring one day or not, or business deals that I'm working with with the production company might go and it might be, something might be greenlit or not. But at the end of the day, I am very fortunate. I, um, I have a you know newish fiance. We got engaged during the pandemic in October and you know, Congratulations. At the end of the day, thank you. <laughs> but it's just at the end of the day, if I, if all I get to do and it, it feels so wonderful and grand, it's like go to the grocery store, cook, 
spend quality time with my person. I mean, and walk around my gorgeous neighborhood of Long Island City. I mean, I don't know. It's just like you have to do the work as an individual to be able to find joy in the mundane because this business is not exactly as you, as you said, it's not always going to be these big, amazing aligning mm -hmm. moments. And it's like, you have to find ways that anchor yourself. And it's good if those things are actually not theater. <laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta have other things to your identity. It's like, what, where do we make? What do we make from if we're not taking anything else in in our lives, you know? Yeah, I think the point that you're making is is so important for all of us to to remember and realize that there that there isn't this one path of success. There isn't a one meaning of success. It's going. It really is an individual, artistic and personal decision as far as what's going to fulfill us and what's going to bring yeah. us not, not not just fulfillment but also just peace in our life to be to feel settled and content which is something yeah. that i know personally contentment is something i have a hard time finding but also appreciating when it's there yeah the age, the age old challenge especially for those of us who are so um, just forward thinking in our careers, you know, it's it's that programming of, I want more, I want more. If I have this, then I'll feel this way. And I think the true goal is how can we find that happy medium to where, you know, it only like lifts us when when the good is really good, but then it doesn't take away from our everyday life when, Things aren't going just as planned, you know? You spoke to it briefly before, but was there a moment or an event that finally motivated you to produce your own work and not rely on others to cast you? Yes, I would definitely say the Broadway moment was definitely the beginning of that. Um. But what that further unlocked, and this was around my paper mill time, my paper mill year, where I was just not feeling fully fulfilled. And I was like, wait, <laughs> I'm singing my high C's in a beautifully clothed wig in you know dresses and starring on the paper mill stage. So why am I not fully happy? Like right. what is going on? And that is terrifying when this thing that you've trained for your whole life and you reach the pinnacle and you're like, wait, th this is actually what that is? Do you know what I'm saying? Like that was terrifying for me. And the thing that I was unlocking, which then led to BYOP and Be Your Own Producer was the idea of no one can give you permission to create but yourself. Okay. So, it's not up to a casting director or a director or a financier, right? We think as the actor in some ways, the way we're programmed and raised that those people do have to invite you to the table. They have to open the door for you. They have to cast you. But like there was some internal work that I had not done and I had not figured that out yet at that time. So that aha moment of, oh, I'm actually the core of my creativity, not my agent, not the director of this massive show that I'm starring in right now at a very prestigious place. It's actually me. So, okay, if it's me, then what does that mean? And am I being the most authentic to myself right now? And the answer was no, because I wasn't fully happy. Which can kind of be unsettling because because like you said i've had those those roles or i've worked for those with those people or in those theaters and it's like hey i i mean th this this is it this is what i've wanted to do so why am i not feeling it why am i not really jazzed up about this and sometimes and that yeah, happens it does and that is great when it happens in a way right because to me that allows us to realign ourselves we are humans. We are artists. We are not, we don't have to say yes to everything. We don't have to enjoy or make ourselves enjoy collaborating with every single person under the sun. Yes, 
there is a level of professionalism we need to be, you know, professionals in this industry. But like, there's not as much of a shock collar that I think sometimes we place upon ourselves. And I talk about that a lot in the book. It's that invisible fence that we place yeah. around ourselves because we think it's the way the industry happens. But the truth is there are people every day out there like Tina Fey, like Amy Poehler that are saying, well, screw this. I'm going to go do my own thing. In fact, I remember when I was getting my hair done and makeup done at Kimmy Schmidt and they were like, hey, Ashley, you're in the Broadway community, right? And I was like, yeah, girl. And they were like, oh, did you know what team is working on? And I was like, no, they're like, she's turning mean girls into a Broadway show. And I was like, oh, so cool, you know? So like, it's just, there are people out there every day breaking the rules. So, and making their own way. So why can't you be one of those people? <laughs> that's how I feel. And that's how I try to encourage my, you know, clients or students. It's like, go do your own thing, you know? Well, as you were starting out, what was that biggest challenge to doing your own thing? Honestly, staying in my own lane, continuing forward without people understanding what I was doing. Hmm. There are, when you start functioning most authentically to yourself as a creative, there will be people in your life some of those people could even be agents, managers, past directors you've worked with, um, even fellow actors or people you went to school with that don't quite understand maybe the choices that you're making, but you need to know in your soul, you're going about it the right way. When I started producing, uh, it was hysterical because people were like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> You're this blonde ingenue that recently was on Broadway, but you're actually the person, you know, who sent me this email who got the funding for this project. Like people, it, it's like it couldn't belong in their minds at the mm. same time. And at first it was challenging for me because I was like, why, why is no one taking me seriously? And that because all I think I wanted at the end of the day, it's never recognition. That has never been what I've needed in my creative career. It was just the respect of like the nod of like, I see you or hello, how are you doing today? Like from fellow producers. And I think people always thought that I was incredibly ambitious and they were impressed by my bravery. But it's like, I feel like I finally arrived to a place where, or you have to, what I want to encourage people you don't need anybody else's affirmation. If you know you're making good work and you're doing good business, that's all that matters. And the point is everybody else will get the memo later. <laughs> right, because even, even as actors, we, we certainly know about typecasting and, and how oh, yeah. we can kind of fit into a groove and no one sees us as anything else. Well, the same thing can happen professionally, I guess, type working or whatever you want to call it, yeah. that people see us as, well, wait, I thought you were doing that other thing. How can you do this thing? too. Right. And you're allowed to do it too. Exactly. As well. Just because we brought Nine Horizons, right? You are a phenomenal, by the way, podcast host. Thank you're you. Phenomenal at giving interviews and creating a warm environment, right? It doesn't mean you're not acting. It doesn't mean that you're not, you know, still going in and singing your 16 bars, you know, this is an extension of your identity. And I think so many people think, okay, well, if I'm going to be a fancy Broadway performer, that's, that's all I can do and that's all I can identify with, that's it. And that's like the quickest way to not have longevity or happiness in this business, I think. What did you find out about yourself as you began self-producing? Were there things that revealed themselves like, oh, I, I can do this or, oh, I got to work on this? Oh, it, absolutely. I'm a forever student. And I love learning. So I loved kind of, I'm crazy. I like like mountain climbing, not physically, no, 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 but like internal mountain climbing. So I love kind of stepping into new arenas and being like, all right, I don't know how in the heck to do this, but I'm gonna figure it out. And I love having goals and goal posts and action steps. 
that's just how I function. That's how I've been able to root myself in this industry for as long as I have and as happily as I have. And um, I realized I love order. I love order. I love having to um, solve problems. That's something that brings me oddly a lot of joy. I like being in pressured situations and I love structure. So what exactly is BYOP? What what was your purpose in forming that? So when you're producing, you know, as I was talking about that show Rules of Cool, right? Those things become, they can become lifestyle jobs, right? Um, it's not a nine to five when you're on a film set or developing a web series or writing a new musical or screenplay, right? So I was like, gosh, I want to find ways where I can help more people, help more projects. So I was like, well, what if we did this on an hourly basis? So I originally started creative consulting a few years ago, but I hadn't branded it. I didn't know what it should be called, how it should be portrayed to the public. And um, January of 2019, I realized, I was like, what about BYOP? be your own producer, like encouraging people to create their own work and making their own way in the industry um, and being um, authentic to their full creative self. And what's crazy is I had just had a meeting with my literary agent in February of 2020. So right before the pandemic hit. And I was just like, I know this sounds so crazy. I'm only doing one-on-one consults for different people writing musicals or making their own TV shows or films and helping them navigate everything from hiring people to, you know, making sure their script is ready to be sent around and and everything. Um, What do you think if I compiled kind of all of these teachings and feedback into kind of like an interactive book? And Amy, who handled my book deal, she was like, I definitely think you need to think on that. Like, that sounds like something you need to kind of like marinate on and then the shutdown happened. So the first week of March, I had already pushed myself to make a book outline. And then it just so happened because I had that book outline ready and those ideas, chapter titles, if you will, um, somehow I magically was introduced to the head of Morgan James Publishing, David Hancock, and I was given my first book deal in June. And now we have BYOP, Be Your Own Producer, it went out uh, for pre-order, now available for pre-order um, at Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Amazon, and we are we debuted in pre-order as the number one performing arts industry book and the fifth best selling. So it's going well, and the book's not even fully out yet. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. See, again, this is one of those anchor moments. It's like, okay, I'm I'm headed in the right direction. Exactly. <laughs> So what have you found as you've been talking with, with, with others and, and helping these, these people navigate the producing side and the artistic side? What have you found to be the biggest obstacles to self-producing? Um, the first is the fear. And I talk about this in chapter one. There's like two sides to fear. There's the fear of allowing ourselves to be authentically who we are and doing what we're meant to be doing because it's the fear of letting someone else down, right? If you're like, hey, mom, I decided I'm actually not going to be participating in this show because I want to start my own podcast, right? It's like you're, you're afraid that somebody might be like, oh, but I thought you were going to be doing this other thing in this other way. So there's the fear of letting others down But then there's also that fear of starting something new. And we talk about this so much in the book. The only thing that really stands between us achieving our dreams is action, is taking Mm -hmm. action and always reintegrating yourself, um, having the ability to kind of always reflect, to re kind of program, to make a different game plan and start again. And honestly, just to continue to be consistent towards those goals. And um, 
I know it sounds crazy, but like at the end of the day, it re- that is the base of it, right? It really can be that simple. Um, and I think sometimes because we're emotional people, we're artists, um, we get bogged down with how challenging, you know, achieving our dreams becomes. It's like, I think we sometimes we forget how simple it can be about just privately staying the course, making things that are authentic to you, to allowing, you know, others' judgments or the no's to like fall to the wayside, uh, to not then allow us to find our true creative tribe and the people we should be making things with. Um, So I would say those are definitely some of the things that we navigate with a lot of our clients and um, people who are in the BYOP family. So would you say that one of one of the ways of combating that fear and kind of, you know, drowning out all the the noise you may be getting is to is to break it down into small steps Would that was that one way? Absolutely. Because even for me, when I was writing my first feature screenplay, I didn't know what I was doing. When I was writing the book, I didn't know what I was doing. (laughs) I knew the concepts. I knew how to teach. I knew how to be warm and talk to artists. But um, I call it an hour a day. And you can do anything for an hour at a time. And imagine if you do that one thing for five hours. So, you know, every week, right? Say you give your, you know, you write best at in the mornings, right? Even giving yourself two or three writing times from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If you follow through on that for a few weeks, a few months, a year, you will have something complete. Like there's no way to Whether it's good or not, who knows? But (laughs) but you'll have something. Yeah. But there, that's the thing. There are tools, right? Everybody can be a creative being. And then there's also people with creative tools. I like to, you know, be one of them. You know, it's just like, come to someone who's a script doctor or a creative consultant. They will help you. They will help you navigate your script. You know, they're, they're going to try to make you as, as good as you can be. You know, they want to see you succeed. Um, but yes, definitely. When something is so intimidating and you're like, well, how am I going to get from point A to point C? Breaking it down into small, and we call them action steps, is the quickest, most efficient way to get there. And then by knowing those action steps, when you say then expand your project and have more people on your team, that's another great way to go about delegating and figuring out what everybody's position is within the project, right? So it's like if you're a writer or even if you're just a like a singer, a musical theater performer, and you're self-producing your own cabaret, you need to know the workload that you're going to take on, the workload that the venue is going to take on for marketing, the workload that the music director is going to take on, possibly a director, right? It's like having those action steps and breaking small things down into little small manageable steps makes everything possible. Because at the end of the day, all those little steps can add up to create a final project. Yeah. Yeah, because it it really is about taking each step as it comes and not getting ahead of yourself. Not, I mean, yes, it, as as you said, you you had a, a book outline for your book. You know, you you, you have right. a, a trajectory, you have a direction you want to go, but you can't finish the race before you start it. You know, so you have to exactly right. You have to do it step by step. And I know for myself, whenever I'm writing for backstage, I'll, I'll, I'll start a sentence and then I'll immediately go back and edit it. No, 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 I want to say it like that or change this word. And then it's like 30 minutes later and I have maybe a paragraph rather than, and this is something that I, I've heard from others, is to get it all out. Just write it, just get all the words down, get all the thoughts down, then go back and start fine tuning it. And I tend to fine tune as I go along, which just makes it that much harder. Because we're all at the heart of the matter or we wouldn't be artists. We're all perfectionists yeah. and we can get tripped up in our perfectionism, just as you are eloquently explaining, right? Where, and it's almost like a version of the imposter syndrome. And, and there are so many people who come to me and pitch me the most glorious ideas. I'm talking huge people, people with Tony nominations, 
where they're like, I really want to do this. I have the outline for the show, but it's like, they are such a perfectionist. They won't allow anyone else to see the script to then further collaborate with them. And they're just like, this would be the most groundbreaking, brilliant thing. If you would just allow it to like exit your body, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's like a child. I, I don't have any children, but I can only imagine it's, it's there, there's that you want to control, you want to teach, you want to nurture, but eventually you have to let it go and see what happens to it. Right. Or it never, or it never leaves. And that is the tragedy. Yeah. yeah. The tragedy is if those stories within you or um, that expert feedback, right. That you have to give from such a wonderful place like the tragedy is if that person or artist could never get to the point where they're able to communicate it because it's like, what is our art if we only hold it for ourselves? I think there are important times in our lives where we do have projects that are more for us and about navigating our creative journey and maybe healing parts of ourselves or resolving things internally. But it like it's like what is our art if we if we can't then share it with people? You know, we don't want things to just sit on a shelf or remain inside our heads and our hearts. It's like what good does that do? You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, very true, very true. And so how have you helped others overcome these issues and really get to the point where they have a finished product? Because obviously that must create a lot of joy <laughs> in oh you gosh. in getting your clients and students to that to that finish line. To see uh, clients and students joyfully creating authentically, there's nothing better. And to just see them joyfully kind of attacking and living through every day, there's nothing that makes me happier to know that they feel supported by me and, and my colleagues and the brand. Um, it's, it's awesome to, to like create that joy so they understand it's like, no matter what, they can always find a way out of this moment. You know, many people come to me and are either really excited and are in too deep, right? With self-producing their own work or they're frustrated with like a lane of their career that it's not moving as quickly as they would like. So they want to yeah. move the pendulum. And I just, I love working with artists and encouraging them that if they put the time in, the discipline are open to learning more and to always being a student um, and open to collaboration. Like there's no way that things cannot happen. <laughs> and I don't want to seem so kind of like whitewashed about it, but I truly believe that anything is possible. And we do talk about it a lot in the book. You can achieve anything and anything is possible, but you can't do it alone. And that means from the personal relationships you have with people that encourage you along this crazy artistic journey to your creative collaborators, or even your coaches and mentors, or you know people like me who do collaborate with students and clients. Um, we all need people to learn from, to teach ourselves, right? In order to move sufficiently forward on this journey. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. You have given certainly me and and, <laughs> and all of us a lot to think about. So thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for having me. for myself, like, like in writing as a, as a backstage expert, you know, that they, they want articles here and there. And in my own writings, I'll, I'll do a sentence and I'll, and I'll start editing immediately. I'll start going back. No, no, no. I want to say that. And then I realize the light just went out. Hold on just one second. Hold on just one second. <laughs> gotta love it. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Hold on, just, hold on just one second. The beauty, the beauty of it is, is that I bought a new ring light. However, I think it's really cheap. And so okay. the, uh, <laughs>
so it doesn't last very long and it eventually Got gets it. overheated and just stops itself. So that's, yeah. that's what we're dealing with. Brilliant. Uh, the brilliance. Brilliance. There, there we go. All right. I, I have, I have light on my face again.